event. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so today we are focusing on races and race equality in Scottish education. Um, this session has been organized by the Inclusive Education uh, Network, Network uh, CIRA. We have three presentations. The presenters will discuss key ideas on race equality and anti-racist education. Um, and they will consider some of the implications of this for policy, research and practice. So we're going to start with a presentation from uh, Khadija Mohammed. Then we'll continue with a presentation from Jacqueline Kennelly. And then we're going to have a third presentation from uh, Dr. Niget Riaz. And you can find the abstracts uh, of these presentations uh, on our website. Um, each presentation will last for about 15 minutes and will then continue with a discussion and questions. You can type your questions uh, during the presentations or your comments, and we can discuss this later. Uh, at this point, I think we can uh, start with the first presentation. Uh, Khadija, I will let you introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stella. Um, and um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, to um, the CIRA event this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to sharing some of um, my thinking around um, the use of um, culture, language um, and religion um, in experiences of black and minority ethnic teachers in Scottish schools. Um, I will attempt to share my screen as I continue with my introduction, Stella, if that's OK. I'm just conscious of time. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Khadija and I am a senior lecturer within the University of the West of Scotland. And um, I, if I just put this on presentation mode, uh, and I've just been um, I've undertaking this PhD for a number of years now. And uh, I'm going to speak from a very different perspective today. I talk often about the experiences of BME teachers generally across this is around recruitment, retention and promotion. But today I'm going to focus it on um, uh, how they perhaps within their experiences um, reveal what we're, we're talking about here in terms of the hidden curriculum and, and really bring to fore and disrupt some of the narratives that our young people are often introduced to within our Scottish curriculum. So again, I, 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 I love the title that I've used here because this is one of the participants, you know, Khadija, when I go into a classroom, you know, I, I take my hijab in, I take the colour of my skin in because I can't change that and my culture into the classroom. And, and, and it, as well, there are many other issues around that. But just to give you the context, um, I embarked on this study about four and a half, five years ago, looking at exactly this teaching Scotland's future. What did that mean for our, our young people and for our teachers for that matter? As a teacher of colour myself, I often found myself in spaces where I was the only one of colour in amongst a very homogenous workforce. And also thinking about our children as well within in Scotland um, and, and the increase in, in ethnic diversity there. There's also this aspect for me about teacher educators folks, that how diverse is our team within teacher education as well, um, and the challenges that, um, that, that present within that. So I'm always asking the question, wherever I go, is the team all right? Do we have diverse representation so that we can then have that diversity in, in, our, in our cognition, in the way we present things, in the way we talk about curriculum? So, what I found in the literature was very much three particular orientations uh, um, that I found that military entities were finding themselves in. And I'll share them with you. The first one was really where um, many of our, our, our minority entities were saying that wrong assumptions were made. They had some, um, I suppose, expectations were held about their cultural experiences. And they didn't really want to engage in those discussions, so therefore chose to teach in line with the majority culture. There were also those who were put off because they feel that they were left to deal with all issues regarding race and diversity. So that question around burden of representation, 
is it just for, for minority ethnic teachers, teachers of colour, to be able to take this work forward? And for some, we're saying, well, no, I'm not doing it. Um, and so therefore, I'll just do what's expected of me. And, and most likely that was this idea of assimilation to fit in. But there were also those who were clearly interested in engaging with issues around race and diversity. And from my research, what really what they were talking about was seeing themselves as advocates of change, seeing themselves as disrupting the status quo, and really getting young people, whether it was children from um, black and minority ethnic backgrounds or all children, to begin to question what they're learning and, and really engaging with it in a sort of critical um, discourse. So it was really interesting. And what I, I found with in the literature was that, so the three key areas, there was the, the teachers who were the conformists, the survivors, just trying to keep their head above the water and wanting to just to fit in and not cause any problems. But there was also the collectivists, the ones who really wanted to be quite active and really took that forward, despite some of the challenges that they faced and the questions that were asked about their approach to pedagogy. So the research questions were essentially three main ones, but the one I really want to focus on for this presentation is this middle one. How do minority ethnic teachers use their cultural, religious and linguistic skills in the classroom? Um, and folks, just, just to say that I drew on um, critical race theory, it underpins the research that I have conducted. And, and I always um, like to use Scully and Ladson Billings quote, that you know, what is critical race theory and what's it doing in a nice field like education? Yeah, education is, should be safe, shouldn't it? We should be having safe spaces to have those conversations. But actually, what really helps me using critical race theory is to centre our conversations around race and racism and that we have to recognise it as an ordinary fact of daily life. So this business as usual form. But what particularly interests me with this particular aspect in terms of the hidden curriculum is racism encompasses um, you know, more areas in terms of visible and hidden, which makes its effect particularly perilous. And, and we really have to think about the dangers around that um, uh, in terms of the hidden nature. Racial microaggressions, again, as part of CRT, um, allows us to see those tangible ways that racism emerges in those everyday interactions within classrooms. Um, and also to think about the conscious or not, um, microaggressions perpetuate a larger system of racism. So, you know, oftentimes, folk, we tend to think about as one individual or one individual teacher who may perhaps um, be um, sometimes racist in their approach, whether it's conscious or unconscious, but actually it's broader than that. It really shines a light on the systemic institutional nature uh, within education around racism. Um, and it talks about also the layered, cumulative and often very subtle forms of racism that target people of colour. And so I'm really drawing from a sort of racial microaggression framework but just to kind of recap around my thoughts around hidden curriculum also, I mean, way back in the early 1970s to the 1990s, we had um, discussions around this and they centred around this sort of terminology, you know, the byproduct of schooling, the unstudied curriculum, implicit curriculum, covert, often silent and invisible curriculum. And I looked into that a bit more in terms of what does that mean in terms of the work, perhaps some of that disruption that our teachers of colour are engaged in? And I drew on um, Nicholas Harlop's work and he talks about curriculum that, that continues to be structured around mainstream white middle class values. And he quotes this hidden curriculum services white students and it disservices students of colour. And so that was really interesting to begin to unpack and think about it from the perspective of our, our minority ethnic teachers in Scotland. I'm just sharing with you some of the, the discussions that I had with the participants in my study. One particular teacher said, I think I'm able to connect with my kids. I speak Patwa sometimes and they love it. And in further discussions around that, she was talking about speaking to the Afro-Caribbean young people in her class and how she felt that just by code switching between English and Patwa, she really helped with the young people to find that sense of belonging. And they opened up a bit more as well. 
Uh, one particular um, teacher said the interaction they have with us opens their minds towards people from minority ethnic backgrounds. So I think, obviously, again, when I spoke to them in more detail, this was talking about all children, but particularly children from white ethnic backgrounds, so the majority young children in, in her classroom. This was interesting. It's, you know, one teacher said it was very easy, Khadija, to deliver lesson plans when we are talking about our lived experiences in diverse backgrounds. It can very often make the learning real and more meaningful and in touch with those we are delivering to. So perhaps early indications there of how just by the nature of who they are and drawing from their own lived experiences from being from a diverse background, they're able to make that connection and that real kind of, um, you know, building that rapport with the young people more easier. I found this one particularly interesting, folks, and I'll give you a, a moment to read it so I don't have to read it all out, but I'll pick out small sections of it. You know, even the very first part of it, I made a lot of enemies in my school um, the day I said that teaching global citizenship is not enough. Um, and we'll come back to that idea of enemies. Uh, but this particular teacher laughs out loud. But, you know, hey, I don't mind. Um, I said we need to make sure that the history, the right history of Britain, of Europe, needs to be taught to the children. And, and again, questioning the idea of colonialism, but also that idea where um, this teacher very clearly says, the kids don't know all these things. Instead, many of my colleagues reinforce the victimhood scenario, the poor third world countries um, approach. And we see that in incidents across Scotland where one particular their teacher in Edinburgh was trying to perhaps, uh, maybe well-intentioned folks, to, to talk about the whole slave trade um, um, issue with her class, and it went terribly wrong. So again, being mindful of our approach when we are, are, are dealing with this, we are not wanting to encourage this victimhood or white saviour scenario, um, which often we are seeing unfolding in our classrooms. One particular participant said, I remember my teaching placement and I was told that I had RME on my timetable. So the teacher asked the children to draw an image of what you think God looks like. The Muslim kids just sat there and stared at me and I had no idea. And I just looked and the penny dropped. And it was, you know, sometimes I'm just surprised by my colleagues with the ignorance that they have. Because obviously asking a group of Muslim young children to draw a picture of God is, is an absolute religious and cultural no-no. Um, but even opening up to that conversation would have been interesting. But very quickly, this colleague says, not intended ignorance. So again, very quickly trying to just say, mm, maybe a better place safe here. Um, this one was a science teacher. Um, I always bring in scholars, scientists from across the world. The other day I was teaching about alkali. I asked the kids, where did it get its name from? Um, it's a Muslim scientist and the kids didn't believe me, you know, um, and it's almost this sort of discourse around um, the, the, the white scholars, the white scientists that have contributed to science uh, and, and particular concepts. But this particular teacher on further discussion said, I really try to bring that to the fore so that I can help all children begin to see how the rest of the world are contributing to our discussions. This was an English teacher who talked about um, the novel of Mice and Men, and, and she talked very, very openly about many other novels that she is asked to teach as part of the curriculum. And, um, and she talked about the fact that it was really important for her to challenge the, the children and having critical discussions um, and, and, and criticise, because obviously of Mice and Men, there's lots of racial narratives around that, discourses around race and racism and how to begin to unpack that. Whereas um, she was also criticised by, by a colleague say, why can't you just follow the guidance that we provided as teachers? And um, we don't need to go that deep, you know, into, uh, uh, into the, to the novel. So again, questions around um, how are we managing to, to encourage that criticality without fear of the implications. Lastly, this one was about, um, again, another um, subject in fourth year around religious education. And I think the teacher said something around, when you think about peace, what country do you think of? And somebody said, you know, um, Buddha, Buddhist uh, countries. And he said, well, do you know what's happening in Burma at the moment? I have a close Burmese friend and I drew an example uh, from that. 
and the children very quickly said, why isn't that in the news? And I said, well, you think about that. So I always get the opportunity, I always throw things in. So again, a teacher willing to perhaps interrogate, disrupt those counter narratives um, as well. But really effectively, what we sometimes see is many teachers of color adopt a color blind approach as well. And again, perhaps we need to understand why some of those take this approach. And, and Jim Cummins many years ago thought, talked about young children leaving their language and culture at the school front door, essentially leaving aspects of their identity. And I argue, are we communicating the same message to our minority ethnic teachers in Scotland? Um, using a microaggression framework really did help to begin to think about how we identify instances in which lessons negate, nullify, exclude, further marginalise our students of colour um, and perhaps also reinforce racist tropes. Um, and so we need to think about that systemic aspect within there. And folks, just to kind of almost finally finish off here, this liminal space of alterity, it's often argued that um, uh, people of colour are often at that space where they're being othered and they're trying to construct that identity within that. And I'm asking ourselves, well, what about thinking about it, as Nicola Rollick says, from a perspective advantage, where we really are thinking about not looking at it as a disadvantage, but seeing if someone is sitting at that liminal space, they get this panoramic view of what's going on in classrooms and begin to think about how we disrupt the, the curriculum, the discourse around that. There's lots of talk about teacher agency and the, the research that I've done, lots of articles that I've read around teacher agency. When I look at the participants, majority white ethnic teachers are part of those studies. I have yet to read um, some research around black and minority ethnic teachers' sense of teacher agency. And um, in discussions and reading work around um, uh, my lovely colleague, Mark Priestley, in terms of curriculum making, you talked about trusted and capable participants in curricular making. And again, where are where is the role of, of our teachers of colour in that curriculum making? How do we create the conditions in which agency can be achieved? And there was a particular presentation I attended when Mark was speaking, and he said, if we enhance teacher agency, we enhance curriculum making. And if we enhance curriculum making, we enhance teacher agency. But again, from some of the conversations I've had with teachers and some of the quotes that you're able to see, they're almost trying to disrupt. They're also trying to bring to fore some of those discourses and challenge our young people and, and engage in that curriculum making, which is more critical. Um, however, there are also some implications there. They also have a fear of being criticised by their colleagues, perhaps marked out as being troublemakers. That has an implication on their leadership opportunities and so on. So something for us to think about. And just to finally finish, a number of things that we need to be thinking about in terms of policy for our teachers, for our school leaders, and I would say also for our uh, initial teacher education institutions about how we focus on race, racism and whiteness uh, within uh, our teacher education programmes. And I'll stop there. Uh, Stella, I think I may have gone a couple of minutes over, so forgive me. Thank you, Khadija. That's great. Uh, you were right on time, and well, what an interesting presentation. But we'll discuss this uh, later. We can continue this with a second presentation from Jacqueline. And uh, please feel free uh, to type your questions or comments uh, during the presentations. Okay, Jacqueline, I, I will uh, let you introduce yourself now. Hi, Stella, thank you. Um, so my name is Jacqueline Kennelly. I'm a secondary teacher uh, currently working in Glasgow. Let me just see if I can share these slides with you. Okay. Uh, so my, uh, let's see if I can get to the right slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm actually presenting uh, a paper that I recently completed, um, and it's probably going to touch on some of the questions that were raised by Khadija's really excellent presentation. So I will just get right into it. Um, the uh, the article that we wrote together was The Time When It Hurts, um, Exploring School Experiences of Students of Color. Uh, I co-wrote this piece with Stella, Dr. Marutsu, um, 
And our findings really unearthed some, some really deplorable effects of racism and particularly that colorblind mentality that Khadija had mentioned in the last presentation on some of our students of color um, and that sort of casual racism that they just experience on a, a daily basis. So uh, I'm gonna just go through some of our, uh, our research, okay? Uh, so in our paper, we argued that the students of color were not being supported or heard in schools specifically regarding the, the language and the discussion that they heard surrounding race. Um, our study was qualitative. It was a very small study, so it was very much anecdotal, um, but does sort of lead to further implications. Um, the students of color at this particular school, the secondary school, didn't feel justified in addressing the racism that they were experiencing. And they talked to me about that uh, and the teachers and the policymakers um, sort of have to be much more proactive in addressing and acknowledging this uh, because our students, you know, in this case, were feeling very much uh, left out. So a couple of statistics for those of you that don't already know. Um, so the UK as a whole had very clear disparities in achievement for students of color. That was from the most, the most recent study that I used was the 2017. Um, as far as uh, minority and minority teachers, um, about 1% of primary teachers and less than 2% of secondary teachers uh, come from an ethnic minority background in Scotland, um, while 8.3% of students and actually climbing are of a minority ethnic group. Um, the attitudes in Scotland was something that we also talked about in our paper. Uh, only 40% of Scottish people surveyed in 2018 agreed that people from outside of Britain make Scotland a better place. Um, so sort of an institutional and systemic indication there. Um, and hate crimes had also been climbing in uh, from the, the last report, 2016 to 17, um, over 3,000 hate crimes were reported in Scotland. Um, colorblind racism, again, something that Khadija mentioned. Um, a lot of what we were working with as far as uh, our framework was based in the idea of colorblind racism. So many teachers, uh, may say, I don't see color, um, and to them it seems very anti-racist, uh, but unfortunately it does deny the barriers of those students of color, and because uh, a teacher maybe who is white has the privilege of ignoring race, um, it can lead to sort of the omission and the avoidance of race and race issues in the classroom. Um, a lot of our students of color do have unique barriers and challenges. And when we say that we don't see color, what we are really saying is that we're not acknowledging their experience and maybe their needs. Um, a lot of teachers do fear talking about race. I think that that's something also that Khadija did a really good job of pointing out. Um, a lot of teachers that I've spoken to uh, are afraid that it will open them up to these accusations that maybe they're being racist, they would rather not say anything. Um, the topic is treated somewhat taboo. So there's an element of civility that comes into the avoidance of race topics and that can uh, that can keep us from addressing the racial inequities that our students experience. Critical race theory is something that I also use in my research. Uh, it really underpins everything that I do when it comes to research. So. Um, critical race theory, just sort of the basic tenets of it um, and some of the things that we focused on when we were looking at our students and their discussion topics was, um, first of all, that uh, the assertion that racism is normal, it's ordinary, it's systemic, it's something that just occurs around us. Uh, the second being that um, whiteness is our dominant ideology. It is the majority culture, especially here in Scotland, um, and it does tend to serve white privilege uh, critical race theorists uh, have a commitment to social justice. So much of the research is very proactive and uh, geared towards ending subjugation. Uh, the acknowledgement that the story of the oppressed or the counter narrative is most valuable is something that we really based a lot of our, our premise on because student voice was heavily highlighted in our study. And uh, the use of interdisciplinary methods and acknowledgement of intersectionality, which is something that we didn't focus on as much but did acknowledge in the study. Uh, we did our research at one large secondary school in a Scottish city. It was almost entirely white. Uh, we had two focus group interviews 
We were only able to work with one group of five students, and I will address that in a couple minutes. Um, teenagers aged 14 through 16, uh, most of whom self-identified as brown. Um, so uh, Indian, Indian ethnic, Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern heritage, and one student who was Asian. And the way that we uh, analyzed and sort of looked at our our data was by using those tenets of CRT that we discussed just a minute ago to address um, the centrality of race, white privilege, meritocracy, entrance convergence, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so we focused mainly on three of the five tenets that I was talking about. So white privilege and meritocracy was a big topic of discussion among our teenagers. Um, interest convergence and white supremacy, which had a lot to do actually with our preparation for the study and uh, the normalcy of racism in those students' uh, daily experiences in school with their friends and with just their peers in and around their school environment. So the first uh, sort of finding that we looked at was the idea of meritocracy, the idea of white privilege, the idea that some people have to work harder. So one of our students did um, bring up the idea of some people have to work harder than other people. So we had this focus group and um, I, I, was, I was there, I was able to sort of be a mediator. I had to acknowledge my positionality as a, a white woman. Um, I tried to allow the students to run the conversation and uh, they, uh, we gave them some topics and they sort of went and, and had conversations with each other about these topics. So um, when we asked the students if they believed their teacher when they said that they had an equal chance to achieve whatever they want, no matter their race, no matter their ethnicity, they uh, wholeheartedly disagreed with that topic. Um, Omar said, uh, teachers are probably just saying it to try to motivate us <laughs> and that it's not true. And uh, it is something that all of the students said that they heard very often, um, pretty much for a lot of them, the only uh, acknowledgement of race or ethnicity that they heard, and it was usually based in these meritocracy arguments. Um, every single student in the focus group was clearly very much uh, in disagreement with the idea of meritocracy. Um, and in fact, when students tried to uh, assimilate more to that dominant ideology, they ended up being um, sort of made fun of for it or called out for it. Um, Omar related several times that he was sick of being called the white boy or trying to act white. And uh, it's again something that almost all of the students had at some point heard. Um, Dan in particular, and again these are all pseudonyms, um, Dan in particular said uh, had a lot to say about it. One of the things that he said was that uh, he thought people were trying to control the way they thought about themselves, control their image of themselves as, a, as an ethnic minority. Um, and so one of the things that we sort of got from that idea was the, um, the idea that white privilege is something that is very um, persistent in their daily lives. Okay. Uh, the second thing that we kind of focused on was an idea of interest convergence uh, and colorblind racism. So interest convergence being uh, the idea that if, uh, if something is going to happen that's going to benefit people who are not uh, of the dominant culture, so anyone really of color, for anything to happen, uh, it has to also benefit the dominant culture because that's where the power comes from. That's where the action comes from. And so interest convergence is that idea that is actually based in the law. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw is probably one of the most prolific um, researchers who sort of focused on interest convergence. Um, this idea that if something doesn't benefit the white, uh, the, the white people in authority in that particular situation, then it's not going to get done. Um, and one of the things that happened uh, while we were preparing for this uh, research was that we, we really encountered a lot of this idea of interest convergence uh, in the reluctance of, of schools to participate in this study. Um, I emailed 31 schools and I emailed each of those schools two times, some of them three times, and I got one response back uh, and the response was no. And it was no because of time constraints or something along those lines. So 
the privilege of being able to ignore is something that is pretty much in line with the idea of interest convergence. Again, if it doesn't benefit people who are in power, if it's uncomfortable for them, or if it's in any way sort of just inconvenient, then it's easy to ignore. So we did end up doing our study at one school. We had originally secured three schools, uh, one of whom dropped out before recruiting happened, and the second who dropped out a day before the focus groups at their school were supposed to begin. Uh, the, the reasoning for that was told to me to be a lack of interest, uh, that the students didn't want to do it. Unfortunately, because I didn't really have access to the students directly, I had to work through gatekeepers. There was, there was very little that I could do to, uh, to find out what the actual situation was. There was a, a wonderful gatekeeper that I worked with at the school that I did my research at. Um, he was incredibly helpful. He was really enthusiastic. Um, he made sure that his school, you know, uh, it passed out all the papers and got all of the permissions. Um, and that student, uh, that student, sorry, that, that gatekeeper, um, unfortunately enacted his own privilege without knowing it. Uh, we asked for students who were, um, black, brown, any sort of minority ethnic student. And, uh, while there were students who were black, who were eligible for the study, Neither, none of them were asked to join by the gatekeeper and the head teacher. Uh, I did ask why, and the gatekeeper said they only chose students who they thought would speak. Uh, he said the black students that were eligible for the study tended not to talk to adults and keep to themselves. And so he didn't ask them to participate. And in that way, uh, these students tended, just ended up being excluded based on you know, really the, just the privilege of being able to choose, to pick and choose who would be allowed to speak. Um, I did leave a note on these slides because I did want to be clear. We, we did think very hard about whether or not to continue um, because we did not want to be complicit in silencing black voices, but the other students were very keen to continue and uh, we thought that it was important to show their voices. So uh, we did continue with the study. Uh, one of the students actually brought up the idea that uh, the reason that their teachers didn't uh, talk to students of color about issues of race is because they didn't want to be seen as the bad guy. Um, the implication being that um, the teachers or, or adults in his life were afraid of being seen as racist. And so they just avoided the topic completely. Um, so in this case, a lack of interest convergence led to the school just sort of not taking action on behalf of students, even though it would have benefited them. Uh, and finally, uh, the normalcy of racism is a, a specifically um, integral part of CRT. Uh, the idea that because uh, whiteness is the dominant ideology, that it is uh, considered neutral and everything else is considered other. And so this idea that students have been othered, not that they are othered, but they have actively been othered is a central tenet. Um, here's a particularly uh, cutting uh, conversation that the students had with each other. Uh, they almost entirely refused to acknowledge that they had any feelings about the racism that they experienced in their, their language with their peers every day. Uh, Rashida, uh, spoke very often about how her friends called her terrorist. Uh, and they would say, oh, you're a terrorist. Oh, just kidding. Um, or they would do it as a joke or they would text it to her because she was Muslim. Uh, she didn't wear a hijab most of the time. She noted the fact that because she didn't wear the hijab, uh, that she didn't get made fun of as much as she maybe would have had she been wearing it. She said, because people don't know I'm Muslim. Uh, and so for her, that was a very normal thing to do was to not wear her hijab so that she would be considered uh, normal. Uh, for her, normal meant following the dominant ideology. Uh, Omar noted that it was a joke, except for when it hurts. They all kind of laughed. Uh, 
you know, but they were very keen to say that it was a joke, uh, that it wasn't a big deal. Uh, these were phrases that came up over and over again in the conversation. Uh, it was it was very important to them that they uh, that they not show that they were hurt in any way, and it was very clear that they felt like they didn't have a right to be upset about it. Uh, that it was just the way that it was, and if they got upset about it, then they were doing something wrong. Uh, so some of the conclusions that we came to based on our focus group with these students was um, the students really internalized their experience of being othered. Uh, they, uh, in, in a way, uh, it really led to them being more excluded uh, from their school and from their, their, their sort of community of school. Um, they didn't experience really any language about race or ethnicity or religion from their teachers, from other school adults. Uh, they noticed that their teachers would mostly ignore uh, when other people in the room, students made comments, uh, and at worst, they would engage in biased language, possibly out of their own ignorance um, and biased actions. Uh, and these were things that the students really openly discussed. Uh, Although they were talking about things that were pretty painful and difficult, they were extremely keen to continue talking about it. They really enjoyed, according to them, they really enjoyed the experience of having the conversation, um, of being surrounded by other students who also felt excluded or othered in some way. Um, they also encouraged that this would be something that would be good to do with other students, um, possibly with students in their classrooms. So. Uh, I found it to be a really positive experience um, and I'm really glad that I got to be a part of it. Uh, these students just did not feel very heard. Uh, they didn't feel supported uh, and they really did in a lot of ways feel sort of ignored um, or maybe at, at, the, at the least not noticed um, and at the worst probably not acknowledged and even um, experienced a lot of bias. So uh, there are some recommendations that we came up with based on this study. Obviously, it was a very small scale study, um, so something that maybe doesn't have uh, completely, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily translate to uh, everyone needs to do this. But I think it is a very clear indication, and I think based on maybe um, our experiences as teachers and working in education, I think that it's pretty clear that this is something that is not uh, just locally happening in this one school. Um, so teachers can be more willing to talk about race in the classroom when it comes up and maybe just more uh, available to listen to students of color and to accept their points of view. Um, engaging with literature about white privilege and about colorblind racism is something that all teachers I think should do. Um, and acknowledging our privilege and our bias, even if it's uncomfortable in order to grow is a really important step. Um, I walked into this study being very, very aware of the fact that I had biases that I probably didn't even know about um, and worked very hard to try to let the students speak and to try to let their voices come through in this study without interpreting them, um, without maybe trying to put words in their mouth. Um, my experience is so different to theirs that it was really important for me to acknowledge my bias and to say to those students, you know, if I say something that uh, you don't agree with, or if I say something that seems ignorant, will you please correct me? Uh, they were very happy to do that and did on occasion. Uh, and it's something that is just, it's, it's something that seems uh, a bit scary, but also is incredibly important. Um, teachers need to be supported in this though, because it is again, a very, um, a very fraught topic and something that teachers are very reluctant to talk about. So um, if a, schools can implement curriculum that explicitly includes race talk and counter narratives um, and also to help teachers sort of learn what that explicit uh, sort of uh, to, to really to think about how in practice we can implement this right to be directed in a way that is more explicit and less general um, schools can practice culturally relevant pedagogy making sure that students are thinking critically, engaging in social action research, um, using social justice themes um, in, in school culture events, in activities, really in anything. Uh, you can use it in the classroom in many subjects. Uh, and policymakers um, 
really could develop ways to make teachers feel more safe discussing these topics, right? To create space for these topics and to create space for conversations. Um, mandated anti-racism training would probably be something that would be more beneficial than the sort of general ideas that we have now. The the race fra the 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 framework for um, for racial equality came out a couple of years ago, and it's just very general. Um, it would be much more helpful to have some very specific training that had some practicality involved in it. Um, funding more research around anti-racism education um, would probably be ideal, but uh, involving students of color and teachers of color in that research is imperative um, because that is sort of that counter narrative that's really important. And again, there can be no neutrality when racism exists in school. So either we're explicitly acting for anti-racism or we are supporting racism. There is no neutral in uh, anti-racism education. Uh, there are some references here and I'm happy to share these slides. Uh, there's some further reading for people who are interested in these topics, particularly CRT, colorblind uh, racism, and uh, some more practical curriculum ideas uh, I've also included. So I'm happy to share these slides with anyone that wants them. And that is it for me. So did I go over, Stella? That's great, Jackie. Thank you very much. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Well, it's difficult when you've got the webinar. I, I didn't really know how to do it, but that's great. And I, there are several questions and comments uh, in into the chat. So um, I'm sure we're going to have a really interesting discussion later. Uh, let's continue with the uh, third and uh, final presentation. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Niget, feel free to take some time from uh, the discussion. And uh, yes, please continue to add your uh, comments and your questions. Um, Diane is uh, monitoring the, the chat, so uh, we're going to pick questions from there later. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stella. Um, sh shall I start my presentation now? That's Yes, Thank you. Uh, let, let me start sharing. Um, let me know if you can see it. Stella? Excellent. That... Yes, we can Perfect. see it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a project um, that we, we put together as part of the Scottish Association of Minority Ethnic Educators. Uh, my name is Dr. Nigat Riaz. Um, I, I, I wear several different hats. I'm an associate lecturer at the University of the West of Scotland. And um, I'm also the program advisor for Advanced HE, where uh, I lead on some um, anti-racist anti -racist projects where, which are chaired by Khadija Mohammed. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to both Khadija and, and um, Jackie, because most of, the, most of what they've spoken about resonates uh, with basically my experiences of when I did my um, doctoral research. So when I talk today, it's very much about a project that I've put together um, where, where I, I state from the outset and it's very much in line with the tenets of critical race theory that racism exists, it's normalized in our everyday interactions, norms, practices and reinforced by our decision makers. This, this paper really is about moving that conversation further to one of action collaboration and how we as educators and members within our communities can become those change agents. So it's, um, I'm going to start by talking about global citizenship in context before moving on to dis discuss the Hamari Pechan project, which is Urdu for Who Am I? So this section will attempt to unpack some of the terminology that we use in education policy, how it's interpreted in, in school settings. Um, for, for me, over the last few years, the words that we use evoke very different reactions in different settings and within different groups of people. As a Muslim woman of colour, I like the fact that today we've, we've very much started by talking about our positionality. Although an academic and a practitioner, when we, d we discuss decolonisation, the initial reaction by my Scottish white peers is it's very much seen as an affront and an attack uh, of the patriotism, history and culture of the West. Uh, it's, it's about the feeling um, that they're going to be censored and the fear of the unknown of what is being asked of them. And also there, there is another side where um, 
I'm, I'm told that there was a lack of gratitude on my part for, for recognizing the place that I have been given and the impudence to question the status quo. Um, the thing is, I started challenging that a while ago. Uh, Professor Stephen McKinney told me, disrupt the, disrupt the narrative, and I've been doing that ever since. So uh, when we discuss global citizenship, it's very much through that uh, lens of the beneficent other. But when we discuss the racialized groups residing in our four nations of Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England, um, it's through that deficit lens of the deviant other, the undeserving, with the focus, focus on the racialized um, to prove that we have the right to belong through assimilation. But even that is not enough because the colour of our skin, our religion and culture put us outside this frame of belonging. Um, Duker and Bhopal speak about it, as well as Jason Ardy uh, in Ardy and Mirza. So the question for me arises is, who are we and where do we belong? If not here, then where? And as that woman of colour, first generation, British born of Pakistani ethnicity and Muslim heritage, uh, a parent and grandparent, these questions remain valid as we are fed a narrative by the state to comply to certain standards under the threat of surveillance and under the label of, of safeguarding by, by the government and also in, in literature. And there is where there is that insidious removal of citizenship, as we have seen in the ongoing Windrush affair, but on the other side where we are promoted as equal and full citizens to equality legislation. So talking about the first term, term that that is up here, global citizenship. Biesta talks about Scotland's curricular intention to imbricate global citizenship through the curriculum so that it presents a cross-curricular and whole school approach. However, there, there, there is a debate of the curriculum for excellence opens up critical spaces for that complex ethical understanding and calls to action related to global injustices and political responsibilities. Uh, and, and Swanson and Pash be going to say, well, 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 where is that discourse that could stand for progressivism yet does not disturb the national narrative and where activism has been written out of the story where it focuses on responsible citizenship? They go on to say that this reinforces that ontological and epistemic supremacy and privilege of the West through the erasure of global events such as climate change, Black Lives Matters, issues that are happening in the world around us that could better engage children and young young people. Here I talk about the term decolonizing the curriculum. In a project I, I, I am part of, we have now extended the term to talk about anti-racist, uh, um, the anti-racist curriculum because we feel that decolonizing the curriculum fixes, focuses more on the colonial aspect where an anti-racist curriculum is much wider reaching. But for the context of this paper, I just want to talk about this term where it's often understood as the process where we rethink, reframe and reconstruct the curricula and research that preserves Europe's Europe-centered colonial lens it shouldn't be mistaken for diversification as diversity can still exist within this Western bias. Decolonization goes further and deeper in, in challenging the institutional hierarchy and monopoly on, it, on knowledge, and it moves it out of the Western fra framework. Sophia Kell goes on to say, it's much more about an expression of the changing geopolitics of knowledge, uh, whereby the modern epistemological frameworks for knowing and understanding the world is no longer interpreted as universal and unbound by geohistorical and biographical contexts. So very much, this is the story behind the story. Um, my interest in this area, um, once I'd finished my PhD, was looking at uh, language policy and in 2016, the one plus two language policy was getting rolled out across uh, across all 32 councils in Scotland. And when uh, we asked uh, where Urdu was in this um, one plus two language policy, where the first language was, was stated as the mother tongue um, and the other two languages, one was to be picked up in primary one and the second modern language uh, at primary five, we were told by the um, city council that there was no um, 
there was no thought to having Urdu being taught uh, either as, as a heritage language or as a modern language in, in either primary one or primary five. Uh, and when we looked at the policy, the working group, although they recommended it, they didn't implement it or inscribe it into the main policy document. So there was no consideration by the local authorities to, to go ahead and implement it. Um, when we started looking at this, Khadija uh, also has an interest in, in this area. Um, Urdu is an SQA accredited language. And what we found was that Urdu teachers in Glasgow were retiring, but they weren't being replaced. We originally started out with 10 Urdu teachers back in the 1990s. We currently have four uh, and one is off unwell for most of that uh, the last few years. And there's also been that erasure of Urdu from subject choices. This led to um, petitions to the local council, and we've been told that the conversation is ongoing to, to deal with this issue. Um, I was incredibly frustrated um, when as this was all going on, and a Sami colleague said to me, turn it round. What would you do to turn that frustration into something positive? I mean, if you didn't have these barriers, what would you do to bring that community language to the forefront? And what could the benefits be? And it led to the uh, led to the planning of a project uh, called Hamari Pechan, who, I, who am I? Um, it, it has emerged very much as part of a journey of how I situated myself in a, the colonial story of where I just uh, describe my journey from compulsory to higher education, where I identify how internalized racism was a large part of my imposter syndrome and the impact it had on my identity and belonging. And it was coupled with that previous call uh, to address the lack of implementation of Urdu as a heritage language. Uh, and I thought, well, what could we do if we then created climate change and added that to the mix as another social um, call for action? The project aims to bring family, schools and community organisations together to co-create stories around the impact of social climate change and reflect on the perceptions of the social environment um, how, and how they would do things differently and how heritage languages can be used to develop and share those stories. This is a call for action and it is a provocation where storytelling is used to bring communities together to overcome barriers and make global issues visible and how they can be addressed by the values intertwined by in policy documentation, um, curriculum for excellence of social justice, fairness and equality. It's about bringing heritage languages in through the school door, as Khadija very succinctly said um, at, in her presentation. And it's also about decolonizing the curriculum through that global citizenship lens, recognizing, valuing and celebrating the ethnic, cultural and multilingual diversity of communities in Scotland. Um, the project is very much um, where I created an outline uh, for an intervention which embedded social and racial justice at its core. It's an innovative programme using global citizenship as that thematic umbrella. Um, and it, it aims to show how we can rethink, reframe and reconstruct the curricula to make space for heritage languages alongside English and Gaelic. It's a call to action. It's about making issues visible and how they can be addressed by, by policy. Um, and it's it's very much, you know, uh, where it's focused around how in Pollock Shields, where we will be situating this, it's it's about um, the prospect of parents co-designing and participating in storytelling activities that improve cultural awareness and a sense of belonging. It, it also presents that opportunity to, for parents to come in through the door. So when we talk about the methodology, we will be um, taking this project into schools in Pollock Shields, into the primary schools. Uh, and we will, um, where Pollock Shield is very, it's, it's one of the most ethnically diverse words in school wards in Scotland, where 27% of the 28,000 population is of Pakistani heritage community and of Muslim faith, where they reside mainly in the East Pollock Shields areas. Um, there's been numerous studies uh, which have evidenced that parental involvement in the children's education makes a positive difference to a child's achievement, motivation and well-being at school. Uh, I will be using, well, 
we will be using a critical race methodology, which will be deployed using that collaborative um, action research and pa participatory action research approach as a way to address both the political challenges and inherent power imbalances of conducting research with children, young people, families, educators and their schools. Um, the project situates the children, young people and parents to develop their own story around the impact of social climate change, reflect on how perceptions of their social environment impact on them and how they would or could do things differently using that heritage language. Um, so it's, it's going to be involving parents, grandparents and family members to, to help create that story. Uh, as well as members of SAMI schools, parent teacher councils um, to ensure that there is that engagement involvement. And it's very much the project is about creating those stronger links across the community and continued involvements of parents and their families and their child's or grandchildren's learning. A qualitative study uh, methodology where BAME teacher researchers will support families, uh, schools, PTAs and community groups. This was supposed to take place last year, but we've put it forward to hopefully this September um, due to the pandemic. Um, but where we will be putting out a call for participants, uh, which will be SAMI, SAMI members, um, teachers in various, um, how do you say, it, various parts of their career where they will um, go into schools in the Pollock Shields areas and invite schools to take part and for students um, if, if they wish to participate. The, the duration of the project will be aligned to the school year from September to June with the output of a storybook ready for the beginning of next year. Um, the story continues, but I'm, I'm quite worried that I might have gone over time. Um, so it's very much um, something that we're looking forward to. And it's it's about looking at, it's, it's amazing when you turn the gaze from looking at something from that deficit lens to say, well, actually we do have power and we can make the change that we want to see happen. And, and turning that gaze as Khadija eloquently says on, on many occasions. So I look forward to your questions as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nigate. That was very, very interesting. And uh, we've got even more comments and questions here. I know that, uh, uh, Diane, you're monitoring the um, the chat, so we can continue with our discussion now. Uh, we've got uh, around 20, 25 minutes for this. So, uh, Diane, I'll let you uh, pick some questions, perhaps, or comments. Okay, so um, I wanted to start off first with um, with Sophie's comment, um, which really resonated. All racism is racism. There aren't any lesser forms. Apologies for the dogs, they're after their tea. Um, <laughs> um, and these microaggressions are as, if not more damaging, compared to overt racism. So I wondered whether we, our presenters might want to maybe respond to that and maybe give us their thoughts on that to start us off. Uh, hi, Diane. Sorry, I missed some of that because um, there was some kind of pushback um, in the connection. So sorry, could I ask you to repeat uh, that? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, um, Sophie's comment was about all racism being racism and um, no lesser forms and microaggressions are as damaging, if not more damaging, than overt racism. racism. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, Diane. I think I put in the chat there that um, um, it leads to racial trauma, Diane, mm -hmm. and for many, many years, I, I argue actually many of our young people internalise, so children in schools, every time their teachers dismiss a racist incident mm -hmm. um, or fail to perhaps challenge some of those discourses, um, young people learn to, to internalise it. They learn that it's normal. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a young child of colour. I've just got to, to, to get on with things. This is part and parcel of my life. Um, and that actually that cumulative effect of years of having that internalization leads to trauma. And, and so actually really uh, dangerous in that sense. But again, also, if we want to go to the, the extreme of that discussion, Diane, it can lead to young people having that crisis of identity. You know, so who am I? Where do I fit? 
Um, and so therefore, we have all those other, you know, very extreme prevent agendas that come into play within secondary schools in Scotland as well. So some real implications for us to think about those, because very rarely do you find things happening in schools that are very, uh, you know, overt acts of racism. And we also tend to think of it as an individualised aspect, Diane. It's, you know, we, we think of the one bad person that perhaps commits a racist act or so on. But actually, it's much broader than that. And I think that's where we really need to turn our focus to within within our schools. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Jackie? Sort of the idea of the racism without racists, like the, the um, Vanilla Silva sort of concept of this idea that so many people think that they're not racist because they're not using racist slurs, you know, and, and really it is that more covert and internalized racism that is affecting mm -hmm. Students. It's not necessarily a teacher being a racist. You know, that's not really what it's about. It's about all of us operating within a system which is inherently racist. It's inherently dominated by white ideology. Um, and so these students, and, and in my study too, the students had really internalized this idea of, um, you know, they're not allowed to be upset about it. It's just, it's normal. You know, if they're upset about it, then they're being unreasonable. That was sort of the, the implication. And these were, you know, 14 year olds. Um, so, so who knows what it's going to sort of lead to as far as their perceptions of themselves in the future. Thank you. I think when, when we talk about microaggressions, they, they don't just finish um, at compulsory education level. They have a way of following you through college, university, in your workplace, and it's, it's always um, what I have found, it's about being told um, what my place is, wh wh whichever organisation I'm in, or if it was like, you know, doing a, doing a PhD, what, uh, what framework to use. Um, and I was always pushed towards uh, dead European scholars, such as Bourdieu. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's about having the courage to push back, to, to, to be able to say, I, I know what I'm doing. I have confidence in myself because after years of being told you're not good enough, you don't know. Let me think for you. You, you do begin to doubt yourself. So, so there is there does come that point. You you have to take, you know, you, you have to take responsibility and start saying no. Enough is enough, uh, and this is what's happening. And uh, I think in my case, I suffered quite badly from imposter syndrome, always questioning you know, when will I get found out? Uh, and internalizing the microaggressions as, as if somehow I deserved them. So it's about having strategies to, in order to push back uh, and to know when that's happening because that normalcy that you talk about, we just pretend it's not happening anymore um, in, in order to just survive through our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. Okay, that's that's super. Thank thank you all. Thank you all so 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 much. Um, so I think it's a question for Jackie. Um, Rose is asking, how can we encourage increased participation from schools in research projects like the one that you described? So I think that, I think that it really does start with the teachers. Um, for me, the success that I had was based on enthusiastic gatekeepers who really pulled the project into their schools. And I think that buy-in was the most important thing for me. I mean, as far as policy is important and you know, schools implementing curriculums is really important, but if the teachers don't buy in, then nothing is gonna move forward. Um, so things like this, I think are really helpful, just getting sort of the word out, getting these new vocabulary terms out there um, and getting people interested, um, getting teachers interested in um, critical race theory, I think, is really important. It's something that seemed to have run through all three of our presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, very little critical race theory research has been done. Um, and I noticed, too, I think Lisa McCaffrey also mentioned the same thing about how can we sort of make this a wider thing. And I, I think that critical mm -hmm. race theory as a basis mm -hmm. for um, professional learning for teachers would be a way to get those teachers to buy in, to become really good gatekeepers mm -hmm. to encourage research into the schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the U.S. I'm, I'm obviously not Scottish. The uh, the U.S. has been using CRT in uh, anti-discrimination training and anti-racism training, not just in schools, but in government for many years. Um, and it's something that hasn't necessarily been implemented here in Scotland. 
Um, I think possibly because we sort of have this uh, what's best for the majority mindset, especially in school, mm -hmm. whereas we just have to get this done. And it's such a small percentage of people that we can't necessarily put our effort into it. But again, like you got to get that teacher buy in. Mm -hmm. Really realize that the othering that's happening, it's not just a mm -hmm. uh, an issue that minority people have. It's an issue that we all have. Right. Diversity is not a, a black minority ethnic issue. Mm -hmm. Diversity is an everyone issue. That's super. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take one more question from the chat box, and then um, I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who's going to facilitate the discussion, and hopefully we'll be able to open the floor up, and um, people from the audience will be able to come in and, and and contribute to the discussion. So I want to just pick up on on Greg's um, statement and and question that comes from that. Um, and Greg says, current provocations around race are awesome, but how do we normalize provocation so that challenge is so standard in life that provocations around race are expected and navigated with confidence? And Niget, I think it was probably I think it was probably at the time that you were just finishing up. Yeah, I yeah, think. I think when, when we talk about provocations, I am a lot braver in talking about it because uh, Khadija and I have just led a, on a national campaign and it was it sat very much on that declaration, which is endorsed by all universities and colleges last mm -hmm. August, that, that racism, racism exists in our campuses and on society. Call it what it is, reject it in all its form forms we stand united against racism mm -hmm. having that this the tertiary education sector endorse that statement based on the equality and human rights commission's report from the year before has has legitimized and, and given credibility to the race work that is ongoing um we have had decades of um research on racism uh, in society and in our schools but it is only now i, I would I would say it's been given that kind of the lens to actually start tackling the problem uh, and it's it's I'm going to hand over to Khadija because she has this really eloquent James Baldwin quote where, she, where right Khadija over to you. <laughs> Talk about putting me on the spot <laughs> niggas. <laughs> I need to get you back. Um, no, the, the quote from James Baldwin, I don't remember exactly, but really it was about James Baldwin saying how how much more how much more time do you need for progress you know um i've lived 60 years i'm not going to live another 60 and, and and so on and i think that's exactly where we're at at the moment we've been having these conversations for decades diane and i was born and raised in scotland went to school in scotland and um you know i was a teacher now teacher educator um and you know I, i'm still alarmed at the fact that we're having these conversations today. Um, but again, with that view that so committed to try and support our teachers within schools, support our educators across the education trajectory to, to, to become comfortable in actually comfortable in being uncomfortable, because this is this is this is a, a long road ahead and, and we need to start having those critical conversations with everybody. And it's so important, given Jackie's um, presentation, Nigget's presentation is something we're really excited about because we're trying to bring some of that into schools uh, within the Pollock Shields area and perhaps beyond where we see some ethnic diversity and, and begin to, to look at some of those critical discussions through uh, community work within schools. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lisa to facilitate the discussion just now. We've got about 10 minutes to be able to have that before we wrap up for the end. Hey, uh, hi. Oh, thank you so much, Katiza. Thank you so much, Daki. Thank you so much, Miguel. That was uh, very powerful. I'm really moved. Um, I've been doing this work in, in terms of, you know, what, doing the work uh, on myself, educating myself, learning and, and asking those questions. And I'm still uh, quite upset by some of them. Um, some of the testimonies 
that, that you brought here from teachers, Kadita, from, from, from students, um, Jackie and you may get. However, my job now is to is to to see well, um, who would like to perhaps ask a question. I can't see any hands here. So if, if anybody would like to to ask a question um, of any of our of our speakers, if you could put your, your hand up. Okay, so let me just see. Hmm. I'm not doing very well with this. I'm trying to see who who, who has the hand up to speak. Uh, Lisa, I can see. Um, oh, right. It's Ken. Ken. Uh, yes. Sorry, Ken. Um, you have the floor. And then it's first Ken. I, th I thought, yes, first Ken. And then David. Thanks, Lisa, and, and thanks to the three presenters. They were really interesting presentations. I asked a question uh, in the chat, uh, given that we have uh, a new Scottish government and uh, a new Scottish minister, as to what practical policy advice would the three presenters give to the new minister? Because we're dealing with a very complex issue. It's not just about policy, because we need to engage the full uh, gamut of folk who have got a direct input ranging from uh, local authority officers through to uh, newly qualified teachers. And there's a big issue, as Khadija said, about how we prepare initial teacher education programmes to cover some of these complexities, right through to community leaders and so on. Uh, and it's a very complex issue we're trying to deal with here, but uh, you know, ministers, civil servants like uh, straightforward, practical policy advice. Uh, what do the three presenters, uh, what do they offer the new minister, assuming it is a new minister, uh, by way of practical ways of taking forward this this uh, complex issue? Uh, Lisa, shall I make a start? Um, just I can start and then Jackie and Nigut can come in. Thank you, Ken. A uh, really good question. I, I was hoping you were going to tell us who the next education minister was. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, policy, my goodness, uh, I think I put in the chat, I started to put in the chat, um, you know, when we look at policy across the board, there are many voices missing within that policy construction. And we need to think about, so whose voices are missing? Who do we need to speak to and reach out to? Often within even policies around teacher education, teachers per se, it can, the voices of black and minority ethnic teachers are missing. The voices of our children of colour are missing. I know within the GTCS we've started to do some work around listening to young people. And I think that's a power of work because when you hear, and, and it links to Gary's question as well around, you know, how do we begin to, to, to perhaps speak with teachers who get often quite defensive about this, this, this discourse and it is that counter storytelling. When we hear straight from uh, people's lived experiences, we can only stand up and listen and start to take account um, of, of those and begin to think about how policy then is not fit for purpose, Ken. Um, and so we need to take into account those voices and those experiences to begin to shape that policy then based on that to think about what action needs to be taken forward. I, I'm sure Jackie or, or Nigit might want to add to, to my comments there. I, I was I was going to say like I was so excited I thought we were going to get an announcement that we had a new <laughs> education minister so and I was so hoping that you would say it would be Corkup Stewart who is a primary school teacher uh, in her different trade and has now become an MSP so having somebody in that educational ministerial team with her background, with her knowledge, with her networks, uh, I think would benefit many, many of the questions that, that Khadija has raised. Um, so I hope Sami uh, is, and Khadija as chair of Sami will be getting invites to, to contribute to those conversations. Um, I am, you know, a, a lowly teacher, more so than a policy expert, I will say, but, um, I, I completely concur with Khadija Naget, especially with voices of color, 
um, teachers in particular being involved in the in the creation of policy. Um, I'm a big proponent of um, practical mandated teacher training in anti-racism, something explicit, something possibly scripted, something created by um, teachers and students of color. Um, you know, and and if it's, you know, again, as I said earlier, like if there's no teacher buy-in, then that policy doesn't translate into practice, then there's no point in the, having the policy in the first place. So more more specific, mandated, and practical, explicit training for teachers. Thanks, folks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Khalid Zanigate and uh, Jackie. Now, over to you, David. OK, thank you. Thanks very much for the presentations that uh, taken us through uh, the challenges of uh, dealing with uh, racism in education. Um, and the idea that was mentioned about uh, how we challenge that and move into a transformative approach rather than affirming what happens um, and how uncomfortable it can be. Um, how do you, do you think it's appropriate to apply critical race theory to the normacy of Irish racism in Scotland? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, racism is racism and, um, you know, it, it's a, if, we're, if we're, we're talking about privilege and oppression, the, the voices of the Irish communities in Scotland have been oppressed and I don't know if this is the right platform, but we saw that on Saturday um, with, with some of the um, very outrageous antics of Rangers fans. I think I'll stop there before I do a political boo-boo. So. I think <laughs> to remember that although it is called critical race theory, it doesn't specifically have to be a color racial um, issue in order to, to, to be applicable. Um, it really is about, as Naget said, it's about um, oppression and marginalization. Yeah. Um, do you want to come in, Khadija? Uh, oh, I think in? I think Jackie and, and Nigit's yeah. response was was spot on. There's also work David being done actually um, around uh, using critical race theory um, to examine, you know, the sort of exclusionary constructions of Irishness as well, and in the urgent need for the kind of anti-racist education that we we're discussing. So, so yeah, I see critical race theory having a, a central part to play there as well. Thank you. Uh, David, I'll, I'll come in as well to say something here that um, just had it at the back of my head. One of our um, colleagues in the University of the West of Scotland, Nicola Hay, Dr. Nicola Hay now, uh, used critical race theory to unpack racism that is rampant uh, against them. Uh, traveling community, the gypsy traveling yeah. community, the Roma community. And in fact, um, I'm looking forward to inviting Nicola at some point to come and and present her work because she, she did work with young people as well. She spoke with um, loads of young people and she did use the critical race theory framework so it can be used. Yes, racism is racism. As so it, it, I'd worked with uh, Nicola in the past when she was engaged right. with uh, Show racism red card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dr. Hay now. <laughs> um, do, do we have any more questions? A anybody who would like to, to ask the detail, okay, you can, can ask. Yeah, just Lisa, say, um, say, Sarah has asked, um, Sarah Khan has asked a really important question. I know some colleagues have started to answer it in the chat that you know, we're mostly speaking about the school context, but my question is about higher level, maybe irrelevant. I don't think it is, Sarah, I think it's absolutely relevant. I'm um, wondering about being a BAME student teacher who's going to protect my interests against discrimination based on the workplace placement. A, 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 a really important question, Sarah, and I'm so glad you asked it. This is something that is initial teacher education institutions that are absolutely dealing with. Um, we, I know certainly at UWS, we certainly have now included within our placement handbooks a very clear statement around um, where students feel that they are experiencing discrimination 
and, and sometimes actually, Sarah, it's the it's finding the confidence to actually speak up about it as well because for fear of implications. Oh my goodness, if I say something, will it have implications on passing or failing my placement? Um, and so on. So we've got to take into account all of those things that are, 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 are there. But feel confident that you should be able to approach your tutor at the university and say something is not right and I, I'd, I'd like an option to discuss it. Um, what the university needs to have are very clear processes in place and how they're going to support you through that, but also then have that conversation with the school because that's important. We, we've, we've, got, we've got to stop saying, I mean, if Rowena Arshad was here, she would say, I would be saying, we're not going to send our students to that school, right? She's very brave and bold in saying that. And I guess in the discussions of school partnerships, that might not always be the answer, but it's actually about saying to the school, so here's an issue here. How are we going to address that collectively? Um, so it's on the horizon, Sarah. It's something we're very we're very mindful of. It's something that perhaps many, many years ago when I was a student teacher, I wouldn't dare ever bring that to the fore. I don't think I had the confidence at the time, but it's there, it's happening. And that's why we are losing a lot of our BAME students because they, they experience racism and they leave without challenging it. Thank you, Kadita. That's a, a very, very important message. And even um, gestures like, like what you said, the including a statement, an, an explicit statement in the handbooks, the, the uh, uh, placement handbooks for our for our students. That's very, very important and very powerful, and it can it can make a difference in a in a, uh, in, a in a student's life. So that's very good to hear and an example of. Um, how we can move forward. Sometimes it feels like we are doing so with small steps, but it's still moving forward. Now, what I realize is I, I don't see any hands up, and I realize it's um, according to my to my clock here. We only have four minutes, and um, I realize there are dogs and and other um, creatures that might might need their dinner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to to I have a difficult job to, to summarize, to, to give some main uh, points here. And uh, for me, the number one point and something that I feel it in my in my body is this idea of the racial trauma and the internalized racism that my colleagues and, and students in schools feel and they carry it around with them. And um, one book that brought that to to to, to my awareness very strongly was a book that is called Whistling Vivaldi, another plus to how stereotypes affect us. It's a book written by Claude Steele and the Whistling Vivaldi is a story about this tall young uh, black man who was walking in um, um, an affluent suburb, um, perhaps um, in twilight or, or early evening and he was whistling Vivaldi because he wanted to he, he felt that stereotype threat the the profiling how he felt that he's going to be stereotyped as a uh, as, as um, somebody who did not belong there and for that reason he whistled he, he was whistling Vivaldi to kind of Bake that stereotype, and there are so many. This is just one example. There are so many examples in that book, and it made me uh, very aware of that burden that uh, our colleagues who have experienced racism and they experience it in in their um, everyday life, how how they carry that burden with them. So we must do something. Uh, it can be anything that we can, and it can be uh, small steps. I was very, um, I was very upset to hear about the reluctance of, of the schools to to participate in in Jackie's research. And but of course, I shouldn't have been um, surprised because I know that Neget had terrible um, difficulties when she was trying to recruit participants for her studies. So so. That reluctance, we, we need to, to, to break that reluctance. So these difficulties around access, which illustrate the reluctance to, to unpack these issues, we need, we need to 
um, to break it. There is a very big issue here that we haven't really uh, covered. So, so you all need to come back, and we need to have another another webinar or, or a seminar about this, which is around leadership and the role of, of leadership. But because we don't have uh, the time to go into this, I think my my um, suggestion, what I would like to do, to to take away and perhaps um, leave everybody with is this: what what um, Jackie said. There is no neutral position. There is no neutral position, and that I know. Um, Negit and Kadija, you like your your quotes, and there is there is this. There are actually two quotes from Martha, Martin Luther King that that fit here, and the one is: in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And the other one is: he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrated, he who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. So we cannot be bystanders. There is no neutral position. So we need we need to do the work and there is um, there is a lot that can be done. I mean, uh, just just one example. I, I started with a book and I will end with with uh, some suggestions with books. Recently, I was reading um, a feature um, I can't even remember now which which um, forum it was in about replacing books like uh, of mice and men with with other books that that give a well a, a, a wider and more global perspective and also another book that I read recently and really resonated with me is a book that is called How to Argue with a Racist which has been written by a biologist I think. Which gives us support. Books like these give us opportunity to work with, well, to do the work ourselves, but then to work with our students because there are opportunities within within the, the curriculum to, to raise those issues. For example, this idea of race um, and, and what it is and what it isn't really. It can be addressed through through biology, for example, through looking at at this um, at, at the biology of it. So, so there are. There are loads of things that we can do, and we all need to, to to do the work. And yes, leadership has a a very important role to play. So, I'd like to uh, thank our our speakers for um, the, the thought provoking and very powerful presentations. You gave us loads to to think about, and. Um, I'd like to, to, to thank all our attendees and I'd like to thank everybody for, for the comments that you've made and the suggestions that you have made and um, questions that you have asked which, which uh, prompted us to go deeper into some, some aspects. The presentation will be available, uh, the, the recording of the presentation will be available online and perhaps what we can do when we Put the presentation um, in uh, in the in the CIRA uh, website. What we could do, we could add some links to some of the wonderful work that uh, Sami is doing, the wonderful work Khadija is doing, the wonderful work that Nigid is doing, and perhaps some other links that uh, could could be useful to others. And also the link to the article that um, outlines and report Jack is research. So I think that's uh, my um, perhaps uh, no very skillful attempt to, to summarize uh, some main points and to thank everybody. And uh, I'll pass it on to Stella for the final and formal closing of the event. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Lisa. Uh Lots of things to reflect on. I would like to thank the to thank the presenters for their excellent presentations. Um, thank you, Diana and Lisa, for uh, monitoring the chat and uh, summarizing the key points. And um, of course, I would like to thank all the attendees attendees for joining us and for your questions and comments. Uh, you can find more information about CIRA and this network on our website. Uh, we welcome new members and ideas on uh, seminars, webinars, and projects. Um, 
look out for the other events that are coming up. Uh, and finally, just to remind you of the benefits of the CIRA membership as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.